Welcome back to Political Paradigms for another week. And we've got a full house. Theo is in the building. Hello, Theo. Hello there. Sonny is in the building. Hello, Sonny. Hello. And of course, I, Toby, am also here. We'll start with UK politics. That is, of course, the focus of this podcast. Another pretty busy week. Um, We'll get on. I think we'll start with the nuts and bolts of the Rwanda bill. It passed third reading. The rebellion was very underwhelming. There was a lot of groaning, a lot of bickering. But sort of the catastrophic predictions from last year basically didn't come true. It was similar to last time there was a vote on the bill. All the rebel amendments were rejected. The bill goes on to the Lords. Rishi Sunak did a a rather bizarre press conference, really, um, where he spoke for about three minutes, sort of admonishing people and going, the Lords must sort of uphold the will of the people and pass this bill. And then he took loads of questions and kept repeating um, something to the effect of, the question is not to me, it's Keir Starmer. Why won't he support the bill? And why won't the Lord support the bill? And just sort of, I guess, preempting in case they attempt to block the bill in some way. Theo, Sonny, is there anything of note here or is this just going to drill on, basically? Yeah, who are you addressing? Um, you know what? We'll go with... Let's go with Sonny first. Oh, God. All right. Um, yeah, probably, probably just a lot of groaning and bickering. I mean, House of Lords... When they want to, when they kind of have the authority, they can be absolutely a pain in the derriere yeah. or House Commons. And I think they probably will be because they don't believe it's right. And I mean, I I think, yeah, it probably will just be a very slow, painful process, which probably will lead, lead, lead to nothing because it, it won't be fixed before uh, the election, I don't think so. This yeah, is, I don't is, think it's going to be much. This is the thing. It's all about the election, and they're not going to have it sorted before the election. Um, Rishi Sunak <laughs> basically trying to bring back sort of will of the people type re- uh, rhetoric. Um, have a little listen to this clip, then we'll go to you, Theo. The Rwanda bill has passed. It's now time for the Lords to pass this bill too. This is an urgent national priority. The treaty with Rwanda is signed, and the legislation which deems Rwanda a safe country has been passed unamended in our elected chamber. There is now only one question. Will the opposition in the appointed House of Lords try and frustrate the will of the people as expressed by the elected House, or will they get on board and do the right thing? Will of the people, Theo, are you buying it? <laughs> I mean, I think he's obviously just trying to continue the whatever rhetoric is left over from Brexit of yeah. the Supreme Court and the House of Lords. It feels, and anything a, bit, it feels that a bit like that, doesn't it? <laughs> Any, anything that isn't the government in the House of Commons not doing what the government wants is a frustration of the will of the people. Yeah, but it's like... I mean, I mean and the, funny, the funny thing is that... What's going I on? mean, the absurdity of that sentence, the absurdity of that sentence, except our bill which designates Rwanda a safe country as if a change of law in the UK is going to suddenly change how safe Rwanda is. I mean, it's, it's pretty hilarious, but in practical terms, the idea of him actually being able to get it passed and into effect before the election and that manifesting electorally is, is it's quite laughable. And obviously what he's trying to do here is attempt to stir some kind of um, fervor around, you know, the government against the, the elites and, and them and the, those frustrating the will of the people. And uh, even with the policy uh, not likely to go into effect, if it does pass, it's not going to land either way. Now, here's the thing. So I've said on this podcast before, the Rwanda policy, if it was, if it looked credible, people would like it. People don't have a, a moral aversion to it in terms of polling. The British public, pretty hard line on immigration. Now, looking at polling now, basically this merry-go-round is hurting at the view of the policy. Is it good value for money? 19% say yes, 47% say no, including 34% of Conservative voters. Will it be effective if implemented? 28% say effective, 53% say not effective. That includes 41% of Conservative voters. Should it be scrapped? 20% of Conservative voters want it scrapped. 40% of all voters want it scrapped. Only 20% want to keep it as is, and 17% want it replaced with something similar. This does not feel like a populist mandate. And you've got Reform UK to the right, who are always going to be able to outbid 
the conservatives on this and go, we'll go further. You know, they're talking about net zero immigration, which is not a practically implementable policy without causing sort of a severe economic shock. But it sounds good on paper. And, you know, you poll that people would probably be supportive of it. The other debate that's broken out, and I'll go to each of you on this, I think, in terms of which of these sides make sense. Because I'm kind of, in previous weeks, I've been on the side of they shouldn't talk about immigration. Now I'm not so sure. Basically, the two arguments are, one argument is the government is viewed as failing on immigration. They need to shut up, stop talking about immigration, start talking about the economy. That is the only way you're going to win. You're raising the salience of an issue that hurts you and it's helping Labour and reform. The other side of the argument, articulated by James Johnson, uh, former number 10 pollster this week, who I've had the odd Twitter exchange with, um, he basically says that voters believe this is a big issue. It is the number one reason voters say they won't, you know, 2019 Conservative voters who are saying they won't vote Conservative, there's a list of reasons why you'd start voting Conservative again. If the state of the econ- uh, economy improved, 30%. NHS waiting list reduced, at uh, 41%. But at 44%, if migrants coming in small boats were stopped, which implies if they don't address this, it will hurt them even more than addressing it. Which, which strategy is best for them, do you think? Shout about it, try and deal with it, or ignore it, talk about the economy. Uh, Theo. I mean, note the wording of the of the of the of the poll it's if migrants on small boats stop coming over not if the government shouts about it attempts to pass a bill attempts to frame it as a culture war in the process of passing that bill without actually achieving anything <laughs> concrete in that time before an election look i think obviously what they're trying to do is just repeat and shout about this so much that the public gets the view that they are firmly on the side of those who want to curb the immigration levels and stop the small boats issue without achieving anything concrete. It's not going to make a difference. A lot of the sentiment about this is, you know, is coming from like, you know, the GB news types. And, you know, that is regardless of what actually happens to immigration levels in the, in the time before the bill goes into effect, that's still going to be the overarching narrative. I think very few people are actually going to be forming their views of this based on seeing the, you know, the levels of immigration concretely manifest, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's very much a rock and a hard place uh, situation. Sonny, uh, any final thoughts on this before we move on? Uh, when, uh, it was one thing when, when we were listening to the clip, it, it is funny how... Um, Rishi Sunak kind of say, you know, the, this is the will of the people. By the will of the people, they mean uh, about four years ago, uh, the people, the public voted on uh, which party they wanted to empower on completely different yeah. uh, information, on completely different, a uh, completely different leader uh, with different uh, policies in mind. So it's just like it's a complete fallacy what Rishi said in that kind of little speech. And, uh, of course, Sunak is leaning into sort of the the populist thing, basically. Um, he's, uh, you know, at PMQs. In the past, we- he said, uh, what did he say? Let me find the clip. He said something to the effect of uh, Keir Starmer. Uh, when, when I see a terrorist group, when I see an extremist group, I, uh, I ban them. Keir Starmer invoices them. And the, the, there's been loads of posters up, like, you know, lefty lawyer Keir Starmer. You know, he was on the legal defense team for this or that dodgy group and all the rest of it. Um, That is really heating up. Um, At the same time, uh, the Labour sort of campaigning is uh, is really kicking off as well. There was a little sort of party broadcast um, that Keir Starmer put out. I thought it would be a good time to sort of have a listen to this. uh, Just the first maybe 30 seconds or so and hear what you guys think. Because I thought this was very unusually strong political messaging from Keir Starmer, uh, Starmer actually. Um, we were sort of talking about this in the group chat, right, guys? And I, I was kind of like, yeah, the landslide is really coming. It sort of solidified it for me. I'm going to play play the first minute or so of this. And I want some thoughts from both of you about the state of Keir Starmer's political operation. And sort of, you know, we know he's probably going to win because of what's happening with the government, but how is he actually performing at the moment? 
choose Labour and know that we have changed fundamentally. Cast your mind back to the last election. Working people up and down the country looked at my party, looked at how we'd lost our way, and they said, no, not this time. You don't listen to us anymore. You're not in our corner. You don't fight for our cause. And they were right, weren't they? We'd taken a leave of absence from our job description. Everything I've done as leader, every fight I've had, has been to reconnect us to that purpose, a different Labour Party, driven by your values, relentless in earning your vote. When you come from a working-class background, you don't walk around problems. No, I've dragged this Labour Party back to service, and I will do exactly the same to politics. Politicians think they can carry on like this on my watch, they can forget it. I put expense cheap politicians in jail before. I didn't care if they were Labour or Tory. So I say to Westminster, and I say to you, nobody will be above the law in a Britain that I lead. OK, so we, we kind of get the picture. Um, Sonny, is this, is this Starmer mania about to sweep the United Kingdom? Um, yeah, very much maybe. Uh, I think that he's trying to be, he's trying to show a more refined, more put together look. And it, and, and, and it's difficult for Sir because he kind of did it to himself, but it, his party is not in a, does not feel or look like it's in a fit way to lead. So yeah, I would say, I would say this is probably a positive sign Starmer, though I don't think they have to do much to win this election. Yeah, it feels pretty win by default at the moment. Um, Theo, what, what, did, what did that make you think, listening to those dulcet tones of Sakir? I was uh, mentioning on the podcast a few months ago how we could see a narrative shift from Keir Starmer from win by default, because I've simply been sitting there while the government you know, self-combusts to I can lead this country, I'm prime ministerial material, and I think this is kind of the precipice of that. And obviously what he's trying to do here is appeal to as many demographics as he can, disillusioned conservative voters, getting back, you know, those who defected and not defected, who voted Tory in the Red Wall in 2019, those who may be considering to vote for reform, Corbynites, people who may have voted for Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, his rhetoric kind of switches throughout the broadcast if you notice i mean he talks about you know law and order at one point then it goes to economic stability two very kind of traditionally conservative positions and then he talks about i'm a man of the people i come from a working class background you know and that's a much more traditional labor message so he's grounded in what made labor popular in the first place while distancing himself from corbyn while still attempting to have that empathy that corbyn you know obviously um created an appeal over and then also talking about tech and development and the greatness of the British nation and essentially just trying to, I think, you know, sweep through all the demographics. Um, so obviously, you know, it's him poising himself for the upcoming election and giving his final pitch and his pitches. I'm, <laughs> the last government has been a disaster, but I'm not just, you know, the alternative. I'm a viable candidate and I can get things done and I have something for everyone. It, yeah, I, I think this is it. And I think it is it is kind of the thing of, um, look, we are kind of, Keir Starmer is what you make of him, right? You know, he's centre-left, he's centre-right, he's pro-tech, he's protectionist, he's free trade, he's pro-Europe, he's pro-Brexit. He's kind of a generic, strong leader is what that, and I think he's trying to, he's trying to project something that is actually in focus groups a problem for him. People keep saying Sakir, you know, he's obviously like, it's like hereditary. He's like a hereditary lord or something. Um, when actually he's not. He is from one of the more working class backgrounds of Labour leaders historically. Most working class Labour leader uh, since Kinnock. You know, Attlee um, was very much not working class, middle class, affluent. Jeremy Corbyn, Ed Miliband, Tony Blair, middle class, affluent, right? Even upper middle class. Whereas... Keir Starmer, Neil Kinnock, um, working class Labour leaders, Gordon Brown as well to an extent. And he's trying to position himself like that. 
And I did, I thought the really strong bit, and he's used this line a few times. Every time I hear it, I think this is probably quite strong politically, is when he goes, and he's trying to, it's like a fight over his prosecutorial record, basically. He's, the Tories are saying one thing about it. He's saying, I put expense cheats, you know, lying politicians. I put them in jail. I'm not part of the Westminster establishment. Um, and, you know, it's a bit... If I, if I could just add there, I feel like that may be kind of alluding to sentiment about um, what what was seen as sleaze among this government. Oh, yeah. You know, party gate and everything like that. He's definitely saying, you know, I would not have any any time for these people oh yes that is that is exactly what it is and you see on the screen when he says that it comes up with something about partygate it comes up with something about nicola sturgeon and something about ppe so he's sort of running the gauntlet and going like we're different um which will probably be a problem because i don't know what you guys think there will probably be some labor scandals once labor are in power um this is always the way of these things um on on to sunak and sort of his position, um, it looks like he's safe for now in terms of a leadership challenge. It does sound like more letters have gone in. I think we all think, I'll I'll go to you quickly for like a one-word answer, but both of you, um, but I think we all agree if there is a confidence vote, he'll win it. Theo, yes? Yes. Uh, Sonny? Uh, Yes. Yeah, Uh, but obviously it would just be humiliating and annoying and all the rest for him. Um, we've got two upcoming by-elections, Kingswood and Wellingborough, both safe Conservative seats. They look likely to lose both. That's one danger point, 15th of February. You know, 16th of February, keep an eye out if more letters go in. The other danger point is the May local elections. These were last up in 2021. I'm sure you both remember the Conservatives did brilliantly for an incumbent government. And, you know, Keir Starmer was nearly toppled as a result. So there's such a, a low bar for Labour to pick up just reams and reams and reams and reams and reams of seats. I think that's another danger point. May is probably the last chance saloon for Conservatives to attempt to get rid of him. I think they could. Um, guys, what do you think? Where, where do you think the main danger point is? I, I would go with the lo- with after the locals. I think the by-elections is too soon. But basically just big demoralizing moments on the calendar for the conservatives in in the next few months uh sunny yeah i think it's gonna i think this is gonna be probably a very painful experience uh for the conservative party the next few months and i do not see them kind of pulling anything that will give them a chance of stopping anything really i I know it sounds really just i'm just like yeah i just don't think it's gonna happen uh sunny what do you think uh theo sorry what you mean theo yeah what's going (laughs) so i'm just a confused i'm just chat gpt i'm on autopilot yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) definitely um well i think they're both going to be big pain points i mean you know the by-election wipeouts we saw late last year were devastating they showed um a manifestation of what everyone had been suspecting you know the sentiment had very much turned against the conservatives but then we saw it turn into a huge defeat and a change of a seat in parliament which is huge um and them losing more safe seats well it won't be good for them let's put it that way and local elections yeah local elections um they can be a decent indicator. I mean, what reform could probably do quite well in local elections. But what we saw last time before an election, the local elections was completely opposite to what the outcome ended up being. The Conservatives got wiped out in 2019 local elections. Yeah. Um, and in that case, they won later that year. But what's probably going to happen this time is that they'll do badly in the local elections um, badly for local elections, considering that, you know, there tend to be older voters who are in local elections and, you know, connection with the Tory party. Um, but yeah, I think they'll both be pretty big pain points. And I think it's unlikely that it could be a big problem for Keir Starmer if Labour don't perform too well, just, you know, because of, well, the magnitude of everything else we've discussed. Uh, looking at polling from the week, I'm going to give you guys some uh, some. Uh, I know you, I know you're ready and raring for some juicy polling data. Um, so an MRP poll from YouGov, which basically factors in a few assumptions like the polls will narrow, 
Undecided voters will go back to the Conservatives. They may not. They could well. All these things factored in. So you could think of this as a good scenario for the Conservatives, really. 2024 MRP, based on now, Labour, 385 seats, Conservative, 169, Lib Dem, 48, SNP, 25. First of all, that looks remarkably like our predictions um, at the end of the year, doesn't it? Really remarkably like our predictions. We're just, we're just that good. We got there first. If that is we the, should sue them for plagiarism. That's the, in my head, that, that, um, that MRP, which implies like the country being more conservative than it is right now. The election was right now based on the polls. They'd have like 50 seats left. That seems plausible to me um, as a result. I saw um, a well-respected pollster saying over the weekend, they think it is now much more likely than not that the Conservatives have less than 200 seats. Um, like that is like the baseline scenario factoring in all the improvement you gov poll from yesterday uh, not yesterday a couple of days ago conservatives 20 percent labor 47 percent reform 12 percent um so that is liz trust level polling um 27 point labor lead uh, and i've got owen winter on uh, x twitter here who's done some calculations i'm going to give you the uh, you, you guys these calculations for sort of a a bit of perspective so it's the lowest Conservative vote share on average since October 2022, biggest Labour lead since February 2023, highest ever reform vote share, uh, lowest Lib Dem share since March, reform in third place for the first time. And this is in an average of the polls, not just one poll. Labour's lead is remarkably close to the equivalent point in 1997, assuming a 31st of October election, which is, you know, around where it will probably be. Labour's current lead is 14 percentage points higher than the best performing opposition, which went on to lose. That's in 1992. Labour were only six points ahead at this point in 1992. Um, this trend is continuing. Since he's done this thread, the polling has got worse, uh, meaning Labour's lead is now perhaps larger than it was at the same point in 1997. For a bit of perspective, historically, in 64... Labour won narrowly after having a big polling lead, but at this stage they were only ahead by nine points. 92, everyone thinks this is, oh, it's going to be 92 again. Labour were ahead by six points. 2015 at this point, three points. Um, 1997, they were ahead by 22 points. Right now, on average, they're ahead by 22 points. So, welcome to 1997. Um, Theo, your thoughts? I think it is quite, well, indicative of, it's just, it, again, it's just the sentiment we've been discussing put into numbers. We've definitely, you know, I think a couple months ago on the podcast, we were just kind of coming round to the idea that there could be a defeat on this scale. And then, you know, now it's kind of become an assumption that this is going to happen. There was obviously the possibility a few months ago that these few months could lead to something that could change the game for Rishi Sunak, perhaps something economic, something geopolitical. That never happened. It's less likely than ever to happen now. The same goes for anything to do with Rwanda. And so these polling numbers very much reflect that. And of course, the increasing prominence of reform. Now, reform have always, well, reform, formerly UKIP, have always been kind of just a protest vote. And it's unlikely that that will actually yield them any seats at all possibly i mean go back to 2015 when you could got 12 percent of the vote in the general election not a single seat yeah. so you can just see that as a kind of far-right tory protest vote uh particularly around the issue of immigration um and the rest again very much in line with what we predicted yeah it's it's pretty pretty stark stuff um incredible really um i do think we're on course for a political earthquake like you say talk about geopolitics the thing with geopolitics now is geopolitics may make it even worse because if we have and i hope we don't there is a serious escalation in the middle east you're looking at higher energy prices a recession and higher inflation just in time for the election so in a way the best chance for sunak isn't like instability on the world stage it's probably stability and the economy improves um but some you know statistics are pointing we might be in a technical recession now which isn't a great start to an election year so everything's sort of going wrong nothing seems to be improving 
immigration's going terribly. The economy's not doing too well. The public services are on their knees. Voters seem to have made their minds up how they're going to vote. We're sort of, you know, if if this time last year we were debating, will it be a small Labour majority or a hung parliament or a small Conservative majority? Now we seem to be debating, will it be a big Labour majority or a sort of unfathomable, unfathomable Labour majority? <laughs> Sonny, what 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 do we, what should we make of this? Is is this sort of an oncoming political earthquake that no one's quite prepared for? I think it could be. I think it could be. Although, I, okay, so I thought, I didn't see Labour getting this kind of a massive a majority because I thought back to kind of 2015 in which they weren't, like, Tories weren't very popular, but they just, they didn't want to risk it, it felt like. Uh, and the Conservatives were, you know, they were tested, they'd already had five years in, Cameron was popular enough I guess but I think so I so I think that they've always the toys have been quite lucky a lot of the time having quite um quite a loyal voting base but when you know when the Tories fall they really fall and I think that Sunak is just unelectable in so many ways I think he's lost the faith if he had any from the people so yeah i think it could be the absolute um annihilation of the conservative party we'll see lib dems as um had a um op- main opposition soon maybe oh that's a bold prediction does anyone else want uh, to, does, probably, anyone, probably does, anyone, not, but does anyone want to put money on that <laughs> <laughs> you know what? you'll be feeling really smart money. i'll take i'll take the i'll take the down not the up on that um yeah no fair enough uh but you know, Sir Ed Davy, leader of the opposition, answering questions about Fujitsu. It's a possibility. Yeah. Um, who knows? Who knows? It would certainly be interesting. I do think. I mean, listen. I don't know what you guys think, but selfishly, as like a political nerd, the idea of a change of government, which I haven't really seen since I was very, very young, is kind of appealing. Just in pure, like, you know, I'm here for the plot. Do you know what I mean? I, I want something to. Sh- <laughs> I want things shaken up a bit. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we need a new season of this show. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of bored of covering all the conservative factions. If I have to do that for five more years, I don't know. Don't it has it kind. has really been the same story. I'd say since since probably the end, <laughs> since May's government collapsed, it's really been the same uh, story. Uh, I mean, what, what are we, we're in May's government. What are we going to say to ourselves the morning after Rishi Sunak wins a landslide majority? I mean, what? Well, the pundits <laughs> got know. it wrong we'll, again. We'll, We'll have to do an all-nighter pod for that. Oh my god! Um, I think we should. We should do a live reaction analysis. What election? Out- I will ask this. It's a silly question, but what election outcome makes would make you guys most likely to sort of reach for the liquor cabinet? Uh, probably, uh, probably a, a reform landslide with Lib Dems as uh, head of opposition. Yeah, I'd just turn it off. I'd go. That's it. I've had enough. Right. Yeah. I think I, I think I just at that point just think right. Well, what's the point anymore? What's the right, point guys. Life? Scotch. Do you think in that scenario Richard Tice is prime minister or does he let Nigel come in? Probably not. Oh no, he's got to let Nigel come in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not. I, if if Richard Tice is the next prime minister, I'm going to start donning the Joker makeup. I can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very true. Um, are you guys familiar with the Pete Davidson? You have shot the uh, Iowa. You have. Pete Davidson, what am I talking about? Pete, my brain is gone today. Pete Buttigieg, right. after he won Iowa in 2020, he goes, Iowa, you have shocked the nation. Um, I'm imagining Ed Davey stood outside Downing, Downing Street going, Britain, you have shocked the nation. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. ye- the yellow be, podium. It would be quite, it would be very bizarre. Though I do, I do think that the Lib Dems could have a little resurgence in life. Um, all right, let's have a look at American politics. We did the Iowa caucuses. We've got the New Hampshire primary happening now. Um, and then in terms of the calendar, the big, the next big thing is, of course, the South Carolina primary that is in like four or five weeks. Um, no- Nevada is happening, but it's weird um, before then because like Haley's on the primary ballot, DeSantis and 
Trump are competing in the Caucasus, so it's a bit of a fudge. So Haley will win because no one else is on that ballot. Um, so it's not, and it doesn't. That's count. probably the only way she can win. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't count. And then there's the South Carolina, um, not South Carolina. The uh, yes, the South Carolina Democratic primary. Democrats have made that their first primary. That's happening in like a week or so. So that'll be interesting just to see if anyone sort of performs against Biden. They won't. Um, New Hampshire Democratic primary, worth a quick mention because Biden isn't on the ballot because they basically moved the early states back, but New Hampshire refused. So it's like an invalid primary, like the Nevada Republican primary. And you've got Mar- Marianne Williamson from sort of the Bernie Sanders left. Uh, but a bit kookier. Um, You've got Dean Phillips, who's like a generic Democrat, saying, I'm not old. Please vote for me. I'm not a fossil. Um, And then you've got a write-in campaign for Biden, and it looks like the write-in campaign for Biden will win. So people are going to come out in the cold just to write in Joe Biden's name. There's also a ceasefire campaign. People are writing in ceasefire as a protest against Biden and his policies in Israel, um, which shows how riveting things are in the New Hampshire Democratic primary. Um, looks like about 80,000 people will vote in that. About 300,000 people will vote in the Republican primary. Um, I'll show you guys an average of the New Hampshire polls. It did look initially like maybe this would be the state Haley could win. Her base is basically voters, some Democrats, some independents. It's the kind of coalition that could only really win in New Hampshire. You know, my prior has always been, if Trump dropped out tomorrow, DeSantis would probably win, not Haley, even though Haley's ahead of him. Because DeSantis's coalition is Trump inclined voters, which is why he's doing badly. Haley's coalition is the little sliver of Republicans that don't like Trump. And in New Hampshire, the only state where that might work, she's currently on 34% of the vote to Trump's 49%. Um, so I'm going to show you that is an average of the polls in New Hampshire there. You guys can have a look at that. DeSantis is down at 5% and going down. Um, Trump attacking Haley, Haley attacking Trump. What do you guys think about New Hampshire? Is this going to be more exciting than Iowa, Sonny? It's closer than Iowa on paper. Yeah. So I can see, I can see that definitely there might be a shift. Um, probably, yeah, yeah, but I don't, I don't know how exciting it can be considering I feel like it's just going through the motions of an already decide, already you know, decided outcome. Trump is going hard against Haley. This is a an anti Haley ad. Drug traffickers, rapists, poisoning our country. But Nikki Haley refused to call illegals criminals. We don't need to talk about them as criminals. They're not. Illegals are criminals, Nikki. That's what illegal means. Haley even opposed Trump's wall, and Haley repeatedly pushed amnesty for She illegals. didn't. We don't need to talk about them as criminals. They're not. Nikki Haley, too weak, too liberal to fix the border. Make America great again and responsible for the content of this advertising there's definitely something going on here because there's definitely a bit of a play on like he kept pronouncing her name in a way that's made it sound more foreign and stuff so they're definitely um and we we can imagine what the trump campaign is doing um do do you mean to tell me that something in a trump advert wasn't true yeah uh, (laughs) (laughs) toby are you really gonna go there (laughs) yeah i'm 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 gonna boldly say the truth (laughs) Um, it's, yeah, and he's, he's going hard against Haley, which, I mean, I think he's basically, he's acknowledging she was some kind of threat, but he's basically buried the threat now. Perhaps worst of all, Nikki Haley is backed by the deep state and the military industrial complex because they know she is a globalist and really a globalist fool who they can easily manipulate into sending hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine. Think of this. Welcome back, Donald, to the campaign trail. Um, Theo. Well, how are you feeling about New Hampshire? Would you say, I mean, this is what I think. I think if Haley doesn't win or even come within single digits in New Hampshire, basically the primary's over because every single other state is more favorable to Trump. So if he wins by double digits in New Hampshire, he is the presumptive nominee in all but name. What do you think? Absolutely. If she doesn't win, it's a sleepwalk to the end of the primary, save for Trump's litigation problems potentially getting in the way um though i know there was last week you know right after iowa people going well you know hey you can still win new hampshire now that seems unlikely 
And so, yeah, that is essentially uh, that would be the burial of her campaign. And yeah, the rest of the campaign would be a sleepwalk. And I think, you know, the attention would definitely um, would definitely go off of it. But yeah, I think he's trying to, I suppose, um, define, you know, where she is in the race. I mean, whatever appeal there may be for an establishment Republican with affiliations to the military industrial complex, clearly, you know, the, the MAGA movement is, is is much more potent. I mean, even in the Iowa caucus, Trump won by a landslide. But then again, as we were saying, I think before the pod, essentially the Trump, DeSantis and Ramasomi vote was just a split, a splitting of the MAGA vote uh, of different variations. And so, yeah, it's very unlikely that the, it, it, it's not going to happen that the rest of the campaign will at all be contested, especially if, Haley doesn't win in New Hampshire, which looks very unlikely. Sonny, what's the future for Nikki Haley in Republican politics? Is there one? I think if, I mean, I think if Trump loses this coming election, there could definitely be space for that. Uh, But, I mean, right now as it stands, I don't think there's much hope for her in the Republican Party for, I mean, in a kind of making a stance for leadership or if, if the Republicans win the next election, having some sort of major part in the government. So, yeah, no. Uh, Not look, for a while, I don't think. I'll give you guys a little bit of Hayley. Um, I'd appreciate it if, if we, we can do this. I think we can walk and chew gum. We all come up with our percentage predictions for New Hampshire. Um, sort of based on that polling average, who do we think is going to do better? Who do we think is going to do worse? I have a relatively bold prediction I think one candidate is going to do worse than their polling, one is going to do better, and one is going to do about the same. Um, but if you guys have a, have a think about that, we can put our, uh, our, our, our thoughts all down in our little group chat in a few minutes. Uh, we'll have a little listen now to Nikki Haley speaking. Trump is at a rally, and he's going on and on mentioning me multiple times as to why I didn't take security during the Capitol riots. Why I didn't handle January 6th better? I wasn't even in D.C. In, on January 6th. I wasn't in office then. They're saying he got confused, that he was talking about something else. He was talking about Nancy Pelosi. He mentioned me multiple times in that scenario. The concern I have is I'm not saying anything derogatory, but when you're dealing with the pressures of a presidency, we can't have someone else that we question whether they're mentally fit to do this. We but can't. She's basically going all in on he's too old, which, I mean, what else can she do? Also put up an ad basically showing Trump and Biden and going, they're two sides of the same coin. Have a listen to this. The two most disliked politicians in America, Trump and Biden, both are consumed by chaos, negativity, and grievances of the past. The better choice for a better America? Nikki Haley. I have a different style and approach. I'll fix our economy, close our border, and strengthen the cause of freedom. We need a new generation of conservative leadership to get it done. I'm Nikki Haley, and I approve this message. Well, there you go. I think it's safe to say if she was up against Biden, Biden's done, right? But it's not going to happen. Um, what do you guys think? Is this is this a strong message for her? I, it feels in many ways like it, it might work. It, it could work a little bit in New Hampshire. It could work nationally it's not going to work in a republican primary uh sunny your thoughts so, sorry you, you broke up just a little bit there can you repeat that i just think do you, do you agree with me that basically the Haley message might be good nationally it's not going to work in a republican primary yes yeah i think the most she can do is prepare herself for the next uh one because i don't know if Trump, say Trump wins this election, I doubt he's going to stand for another one. I don't think he's going to be in his, what, 90s. I mean, he wouldn't be constitutionally eligible if he if he wins. Oh, and God, of course. Apologies, wow. Um, that, although, hey, you know, maybe he'll... So that might, not be a, that might not be a problem for him. Maybe he'll shake oh, it up. Actually, he might just change the rules. Yeah. Might be like, I mean, that is the deep state constitution, after all. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the constitution is because of the deep state. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh no. go on sonny 
Sorry, I was going to say that, no, I think that what anyone can do right now is prepare themselves for four years' time, really. Yeah. Um, I have my doubts about her in 2020, uh, 2028, purely because I feel like the heir to Trump, whoever he decides that will be, will probably have a leg up in 2028, particularly if he chooses a strong conservative female running mate. I feel like she would be the one to watch, whoever it is, in 2028, um, unless he himself does it. But in some ways, imagine 2028, Biden wins again. Democrats nominate someone other than Biden to go up against 82-year-old Trump. I don't think it's going to happen. You know, I don't think he can. I don't, I don't think Trump has the sort of political riz to pull off a 2028 victory. So, like, yeah, this might be his last go. I don't know. But my, my, my instinct is, like, until he's literally dead, he'll keep running. Unless he wins. Um, so the mer- the merry go round could could come round again. Um, should we do our predictions? I think so. Okay, go on then. Put them through. Okay. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, wait, you... Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's taking me. It's taking me a second. Sunny's is taking a minute. Ours yeah. Is... Sorry, guys. Ours is very similar, Theo. So. Mm. I have Trump on 51%. You have Trump on 52%. So we both think he's going to overperform, basically. Um, well, yes, I think so. Haley, you've got her on 32. I've got her on 31. I have DeSantis at three. Which, by the way, uh, it's probably worth a mention. Rizless Ron. What went wrong? I mean, what? Oh, uh, you really just took my line. <laughs> <laughs> the Colossus. He was a Colossus in 2020. What happened to this guy? He should have. He should have. He should have stayed as as governor of Florida. I mean, he created a lot of political leverage with that, and I think he just kind of blew it all yeah. straight away when he could have spent many more years being the most popular governor in the country and had a strong campaign in the future. Uh, Sunny is. Oh wow. Sunny is. Wait, hang on. Sunny is. I think the I've mo- done some maths wrong. I don't know. Sunny is the most bullish on Trump. Sunny has Trump winning by twenty four. I have him winning by twenty. 54. Theo has him winning by twenty. I think this is probably I will right. I say something interesting. A, a, a good reason to be bullish on Trump. Apparently, Ramaswamy spoke to him backstage and mentioned that um, mentioning to voters in New Hampshire who lean quite libertarian, there's a big block of libertarians in New Hampshire who vote Republican, mentioning opposition to a, a, Fed, a Federal Reserve digital currency will go down really well with them. And Trump actually then went on to mention that in a speech to a, <laughs> essentially a standing ovation. So there is reason to believe that he could actually overperform in New Hampshire because of the adjustments he's made recently. Yeah, Ramaswamy, well, I... Ramaswamy has come out swinging for Trump in New Hampshire. Um, yes. Which Potential probably... VP? Who well, knows? Do you know what? It would be the worst possible political pick for Trump, but is, doesn't that almost make it more likely he'd do it? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, the, the worst political pick for Trump is one that will still get him really far. Just, you know, that's the, that's the mega brand. He's yeah. very popular. If he picks, you know, Ramos, I mean, can you imagine how swing voters would react to Ramaswamy? <laughs> Trump, <laughs> the Trump Ramaswamy ticket. Um, I, honestly, I don't think um, Trump would be able to tolerate such a big personality essentially mm. competing for attention on the ballot. That's why he had Mike Pence. Mike Pence was very kind of meek and submissive do you know so what I, i've seen a good pick i've seen reported a lot is like he's judging like the female running mate idea based on like who the hottest female politician he can pick is that's genuinely a factor that he's considering um yeah well then he should pick is, aoc which is which well, is not a conservative republican but that I mean, yeah that, but if he's judging it that way then i well, i do not comment on these matters but that is, we're impartial on this podcast, but that genuinely, the fact that that is, I mean, if I told you 10 years ago, the Republican front runner is deciding who's the most attractive potential running mate. I mean, what would you say? Yeah. I'd say, I'd say, I'd say given the, the, given the direction politics has gone in the last 10 years, that is just a natural corollary of that. Yeah. That is completely expected. That would be within the models you create to predict what would happen. Do you think pres- presidential candidates will be judged on fitness in the decades to come? Do you think this is a thing that's going to come into politics? Like, once, once Gen Z starts voting, probably yes. I'm just imagining, like, I mean, was Obama kind of, was that part of his appeal? You know, young, attractive guy? I, well, he was very statesman-like, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I think mean, that was definitely height, part of it. They say height actually does affect it. That's why DeSantis supposedly 
Yeah. Bears heels. I mean, DeSantis so. does not have political riz, does he? He's not like an attractive no. political figure. I mean, Trump. He's a bit like no. Pence in that way. Trump isn't either, but you do hear people go, "Oh, Trump's kind of attractive." And I'm like, uh, "What?" <laughs> so he's, whatever. He's obviously got something <laughs> going on. Um, final story, and this is a good story, guys. I'm going to tell you a good story about Joe Biden. The ec- no. the economic um, data is looking pretty good. There are lots of caveats for this. If we have a massive oil shock, this goes out the window. If uh, interest rates are too tight. We have a recession. This goes out the window. Consumer confidence in Michigan and across the country, Michigan was one where the data came out recently, has shot up. Um, it's not at record highs. It's still pretty low, but it's shooting up at a record speed. Consumer confidence. About 60% of voters think their personal condition is better and getting better. Uh, voters still think Biden's performing badly on the economy. They think the US economy is doing badly. but that might be a lagging indicator. Historically, that catches up later. Consumer confidence is going up. Inflation is going down. Unemployment is staying down. Growth is staying strong. And every sort of historical political correlation, sorry, I can't get the word right. Every historical (laughs) political correlation, you see what I'm reaching for? Anyway, every single historical political, political correlation points to Biden's approval rating and his head-to-head polling will improve in the next three to four months. Is this going to happen? Because seeing all these numbers, I'm quite bullish on Biden now. You know, I'm saying 60% against Trump he's favoured. Um, Theo, what do you think? Are you bullish on Biden? The Biden boom? Morning in America with Biden? Oh, stop. Uh, no, I definitely do think that... Um any kind of, you know, uptick in the economy, whether it's, uh, re- well, yeah, it will definitely benefit the sitting administration, especially in election year. The latent effects of the consequences of the measures that were taken in order to bring about this change um, will obviously be felt well into the next administration. This has very strange parallels with the recent drop in inflation in the UK, yeah. it was essentially, you know, the fallout of the Ukraine war and the energy prices coming down. So when the energy prices uh, from the Ukraine war fell, that led to inflation, where well, it distorted the inflation figures and led to them falling and the government then claiming credit for that. Similar to this, the COVID recovery is, you know, reaching its end. And so the US eco- economy is naturally recovering and then Biden can, you know, claim credit for that. And it you know, electorally will benefit him. And then, yes, I think it will be a massive, um, you know, pro for him to bring to his campaign. So I'd say I'm also, I, I, I would be quite bullish on Biden as well. I mean, you get the idea that Trump is, you know, coming back stronger than ever from the primary, but you've got to remember, you know, that's the Republican primary within the party. And realistically, the other figures there are not massively compelling. But if you look at the wider population, and, you know, the disillusionment, especially with his ongoing legal cases and the, you know, uh, legacy of January 6th, the rest of the country could be quite in favour of Biden. You know, not not just, you know, as a not Trump candidate, but, you know, as a genuine candidate they support. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where right now everyone's like Trump's going to win. You know, nothing can stop it. I think that's too defeatist. I think it is very much, you know, it's an expression of how much shit biden is in that there's a really strong chance trump can beat him but i also think let's not pretend this isn't the guy that barely won against like the least popular politician in american history and then lost the midterms by record margin lost the senate the next time lost as an incumbent president for the first time since 1992 hand-picked candidates that then lost in a midterm election with 10 percent inflation and a, a president with a 40 percent approval rating he's not a winner Right, he's not. If he wins, it's because Biden's a loser. It's not because he's a winner. Um, so you know, if Biden has a sixty percent chance, you know, maybe he should have an eighty percent chance. But it's still, it's still better than people think at the moment. Um, Sonny, what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, I think. Well, there's always the kind of there's always the saying that you know, you don't win an election, the government loses the election. Yeah, uh, and I think that, tr- but. It does just feel like Biden, although, you know, he's kind of this, people say like he's always like, you know, he's a rickety old man who 
you know, doesn't know who he is half the time and how is he going to run the country? He has, like, things, it's, <laughs> maybe it's a really bad way of judging it. Things aren't that bad, you know? It's, it's, it's obviously incredibly difficult for a number of Americans, but I think that the situation in America does, that does need to approve, and get better, obviously, but it's not actually... Uh, it's not as like it, the, as it's, it's, not, st- it's not like the UK. Is that what you're trying to exactly, get? Exactly. Yeah, and I think and I think that the Republican, I think the Democrats are happy with Trump, uh, with Biden. Sorry. Uh, so I think that it will end up. I I I think if if Biden does kick on, uh, I think he does have you know sixty sixty five percent chance of winning. Yeah, which is obviously very high, considering you know. The entire world order might upend in like 12 months and there's a 40% yes. chance of that. So that's still huge. Um, anyway, folks, uh, thank you for joining me. We will be back for a New Hampshire reaction podcast. Who knows? Maybe Rizless Ron will drop out. He probably won't, but he might drop out of the race. Who knows? Um, it's just kind of a humiliation tour at this point, isn't it? Um, but I'll speak to you all soon. And thank you for joining me. Theo, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And Sonny, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.